Go to the right-hand side. And I'm not sure who's leading this part of the service, so here I am. We're going to, um, I don't know what the notices are. I know that there's a meeting next Sunday at 5 o'clock to talk about the buildings. We need lots of people involved. We need people who can do stuff, but we need people who can organize stuff as well. And so if you can, uh, some people think the meeting's today. It, well, it, it, it might be, but I'm not here today. I'm preaching at our other church in Oxford. Um, then we've got our regular Bible studies and all those kind of things happening. But we're here for a very particular reason. We're here because we believe in a living God. We're here because when we see things like the third major earthquake in Afghanistan in a week, when we see what's happening in the Middle East, we know that we need to find our wisdom, our strength, and our courage at the foot of the cross. Let's pray. Loving Heavenly Father, we come before you this morning and we acknowledge that you are the Lord of Lords, the King of Kings, and the hope of the whole world. Lord, we come to you today because although the world is going through different things, we also need to drink deeply of the well that is Jesus. We need to give thanks, Lord, because you have actively been involved in our lives, watching over us, protecting us, providing for us, and, and loving us. Lord, we also confess that we haven't always done so well. Sometimes we try to do things in our own strength, and that never works. Sometimes we don't respond to your spirit when you nudge us in a particular direction. But as I read Scripture, Lord, the most amazing thing is that you never, ever, ever give up on us. You are always forgiving, always calling again, always reminding us who we are. We are children of the Most High God, brothers and sisters with Christ. And we come to worship you, our Lord, our King and our Savior. In Jesus' name, amen. So folks, we're going to um, have a little bit of time of worship and then we're going to pause and we're going to take some time to organize our response to the Middle East. You cannot, as a good Christian person, not believe in this moment that God has something for the church to do. It is absolutely dreadful what is going on. And one of the challenges we have is everyone's telling us how to respond. It's the Lord, through the Holy Spirit, that guides His church. So just be free amongst us. If there is a crisis and there's a fire, who knows? Right? There's a fire door there, a fire door there. Be relaxed if you're visiting us. And um, let's just for a moment get ready to enter into the presence of our most amazing Lord. Thank you, Scott. Would you like to stand? So on, on the back of that, we, um, we've all been inundated in the news about all the stuff that's going on in the world at the moment, and there's a lot going on in the world. Let's, let's remind ourselves of what can keep us going this morning. We've got a, I think, where's, where's David? David's talking today on the authority of Jesus. So the focus today is on about reminding ourselves that Jesus does have authority. Jesus does have that power that we sometimes forget to, to acknowledge. And we try and go through this life without thinking about Jesus in our lives, without having that foundation. So as we, as we sing the, the next few songs, I just encourage each of us to, to think of Jesus, think of the power that he has in helping us through each, each and every moment of each day. Because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, oh, fear is gone. Because I know he holds the future 
And life is worth the living just because he lives. God sends his son. They call him Jesus. He came to love, heal and forgive. He lived and died to buy my pardon. An empty grave is there to prove my Savior lives. Because He lives, I can face tomorrow. Because He lives, all oh, fear is. Father, that is so true. This life that we live is not worth living if we don't know you. Because oh, we can no. be so surrounded with fear and anxiety and worry about all of the stuff that we have in our daily lives, on our day-to-day, -day, but also on the, the, the news, the things that are going on in the outside world. We pray, Father God, this morning that you come down. Fill each heart here. Fill each of us, Lord Jesus, with your Holy Spirit and the firm foundation of your kingdom. Fill us with your confidence, Lord God, and your authority and your power this morning. Because this life we can beat, Lord Jesus, with you in it, is walking with us. Amen. <clears throat> Against me, but won't prosper. When 
when the darkness falls it won't prevail Cause the God I serve knows only how to triumph My God will never fail Oh my God will never fail I'm gonna see a victory I'm gonna see a victory For the battle belongs to you Lord I'm gonna see a victory I'm gonna see a victory For the battle belongs to you Lord Power. There's power in the mighty name of Jesus. Every war he wages, he will win. I'm not backing down from any giant, because I know how this story ends. Yes, I know how this story ends. I'm gonna see a victory, I'm gonna see a victory, for the battle belongs to you, Lord. And I'm gonna see a victory, I'm gonna see a victory, for the battle belongs to you, Lord. You take what the enemy meant for evil, and you turn it for good. You turn it for good You take what the enemy meant for evil And you turn it for good You turn it for good You take what the enemy meant for evil And you turn it for good You turn it for good You take what the enemy meant for evil and you turn it for good You turn it for good I'm gonna see a victory I'm gonna see a victory For the battle belongs to you, Lord I'm gonna see a victory I'm gonna see a victory For the battle belongs to you, Lord what the enemy meant for evil And you turn it for good You turn it for good You take what the enemy meant for evil And you turn it for good You turn it for good You take what the enemy meant for evil And you turn it for good you turn it for good. Lord Jesus. Yes, Lord Jesus, we pray that that is the case this morning. That all of these things that are going on around us do, do turn for good in your name. Let your name be honored. Let your name be glorified in this world of ours. Because, Lord Jesus, we know. We know that you are the all-powerful, all-amazing God amongst us. Jesus. Seated above, enthroned in the Father. Destined to die, poured out for all mankind. God's only Son, perfect and spotless One. He never sinned, but suffered as if He did. All of God. Savior, 
worthy of honor and glory, worthy of all of our praise, you overcame. Jesus, awesome in power forever, awesome and great is your Father's plan. You're sending us out light to this broken land. All our authority, every victory is yours. By the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony, everyone will overcome. We will overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. Thank you for the victory that we have in Christ. Amen. Thank you for all that you've done. Amen. Hallelujah. All right. <clears throat> so, I've lost my stuff. There's my stuff. <clears throat> I don't know about you, but I've been kind of watching the news channels a lot. And I, I kind of come to the point where I don't know who to believe anymore. I saw one story which was really, really amazing. These people filming, and they had a, in the middle of filming, they had to climb in a ditch and kind of film and talk like this because there were bombs flying overhead. And then later someone posted a picture of them setting up the shot. And you kind of go, come on. Really? Is this the time? But... One of the things we do as Christians is we look to the Lord. And um, I've been doing a lot of that this week. I happen to be reading Samuel, and guess what? It has the Israelites fighting the Philistines. Same story over again. And um, they lose. So they take the Ark of the Covenant into battle, and they lose again, and they lose the Ark of the Covenant and eventually, the Philistines acknowledge that they don't want this God. He's too powerful. He's upsetting their God. And they send it back. But the Israelites are still losing. And eventually, Samuel calls them, I think, to Ramah. 
And he says, the reason you're losing is not because you're not strong, but because you're not strong in the Lord. You need to repent and bring it to the Lord, and He will lead. And it's amazing, while they're doing that, and it's the kind of echoes of what happened last week, as it was the end of a holy festival and the Jewish nation was gathered, they were attacked. And the Philistines attacked, except for they heard the sound of the Lord's voice and ran. I think there's wisdom in that. It is the Lord we turn to. And it is the Lord who is our protector. I cannot, as a Christian, condone violence of any sort or any form. Somehow, in this whole situation, what I haven't seen much of is let us get on our knees and pray. Are there prayer vigils out there? Are there days of prayer? No. Not too many. It's interesting that the Amorites are thinking of joining in the attack, right, in the time of Samuel, and they decide not to, which is where Syria is today. I think there's a big moment here for the church. And so I spend quite a bit of time looking at how do we respond. And we're going to do a couple of things. We are hoping to have a 24-hour prayer vigil. I spent the last three days trying to work out how to do that online. I need help. Anybody who has skills in that, please chat to me after the service. Otherwise, I'll go and bash my head some more. And that's going to be online because as a church, it's about reaching out. We have also written a prayer for the peace in the Middle East. And I have a copy for every person here, and that will go out on our emails and on our stuff just to guide us. You might want to pray other things, but this is the starting point. And on the reverse side, on Friday, the 24-hour prayer vigil will start at midnight and go right through for 24 hours, because it's a 24-hour prayer vigil, isn't it? We're asking you to take a 20-minute slot as soon as I can work out how to do that, right? But we are also going to be opening the church from 7 o'clock till 7 o'clock for you to come and pray. We're going to be inviting the communities around here to come and pray. I'm going to be here for most of the day. My plan was to be here for all of the day, but something amazing has happened. God has answered a prayer. On the 9th of November, I was having my ceremony to be welcomed as a British citizen. God changed it. It's Friday. <laughs> so... From about quarter to nine to about quarter to 11, I'm not going to be in the building. But we want to have other people here just to welcome, to pray, to right through the day. So I need help in those two hours, but I need help the whole day. So I put together a very, very brilliant graph, you can see. And I'm going to send that around. If you can come on Friday, just let me know, right? And we'll put a plan out. We'll be emailing out, but I'm going to ask some wonderful, brilliant people to hand out um, our prayer um, list. And this is not the end of it. This is the beginning because I believe this is a significant moment for our church and a significant moment for God's church. This morning I was reading a story of a man who was Islamic and he came out of Islam and gave his life to the Lord. And he went back to Gaza to work as a missionary. We don't know where he is. Have you noticed, we've talked about the Jewish people, we've talked about the Christian people, uh, so, so the Islamic people, we have not mentioned that there is a church in Israel and a church in Palestine, and right now, they are right on the spot. And where is the church behind them? So before we kind of move on to the sermon, which is, is David today, I thought that as our prayers of intercession, we will pray this prayer. And let this be something we pray daily, and let this be something that continues to... Look at all these wonderful volunteers, right? Do you see the organizational skill of Tabitha? She's managed to get the most energetic members in our church ministering. 
right, and handing out pamphlets. That's brilliant. Let us pray. We pray to you, almighty and all-powerful God, because we know you are a God of love who loves each person in this world so much that you sent through, um, your Son that through him all could find salvation. Today we recognize that your very Son, our Lord Jesus, looked heartbroken on the city of Jerusalem and said, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it. How often I have desire, desired to gather your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, and yet you are not willing. That very same Jesus weeps to see the ongoing conflict in the Holy Land and prays for peace. We who are his followers join in that prayer of peace. We pray for an end to the cycle of violence and death. We pray against those who would spread hatred and disinformation, inflaming more violence. We pray for those who've lost loved ones and that all the hostages would be returned safe. We pray for Christians living in Palestine and Israel for their protection and their witness, uh, that their witness would lead to many people putting their faith in our Lord Jesus. We pray for the global church that we would not rest, but we would unite in prayer for peace and for a revival in the Holy Land. We pray the words of Isaiah chapter 2. In the days to come, the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established as the highest of mountains and shall be raised above the hills, and all the nations shall stream to it. Many people shall come and say, Come, let us go to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of our God, the God of Jacob, that he may teach us his ways and that we may walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall come forth instruction and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He will judge between the nations and shall arbitrate for many people. They shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation, nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. O house of Jacob, come, let us walk in the light of the Lord. We pray that the day of peace is now. We pray that those who manufacture weapons of war would repent and use their skills to make instruments of peace. We pray in the humanitarian Christ that is growing that your church would see opportunities to show the real face of Christ by taking the lead in terms of rebuilding that which is destroyed. We pray for the peace of Jerusalem. May they prosper who love you. Peace be within your walls and security within your towers. For the sake of my relatives and friends, I will say, peace be with you. For the sake of the house of the Lord our God, I will seek your good. We pray and commit to seek out the Lord's peace in this time of crisis to his glory and his honor. Amen. We continue to pray for our world, Lord. There is so much going on. I want to pray for this church as we come together and, and just make sure that we do the best we can for your kingdom. We pray if, if somebody smashed our window that we forgive them right now in Jesus' name. We pray, Lord Jesus, for this area where there are people who are struggling and looking for faith, that we would be the kind of church where many people can come and know the love of Jesus. We pray for the leaders of this church as they meet this week to discuss and plan that you would bless those who give so much of their time and energy to you. So Holy Father, we give you these prayers now. And as we come to the time where we are ready to hear the word, we pray you open our hearts and minds. We also, Lord, pray and thank you for each person who is generously given of their time and of their treasures and their talents to this church. Bless their offerings in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I didn't get the chance to come on the motorbike today because uh, <clears throat> I had to go to a nursing home to bring someone into our care at the Chapel of Rest. And uh, I didn't even know if I was going to get here in time. But uh, it's all gone peaceful now. And I feel calm. Do I look smart enough for this uh, motley bunch? Yeah. I hope you're all wearing a tie at home. 
Right. Uh, the other thing is, and it's quite strange how this happens, um, I battled with what I was going to say. And part of it is because of the scripture reading I was given. And uh, this morning at about 4.30, I woke up and thought, oh, let's go and sort this out. Put it, things to, down on paper that's in my mind. So hopefully I've printed off the right notes that I took <laughs> uh, when I got up at 5.30. Matthew 9, 37, 38 to chapter 10, verses 1 to 4. My passage that I've been given for today is the chapter 10 part, but it said, Then he said to his disciples, The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. Jesus called his 12 disciples to him and gave them authority to drive out impure spirits and to heal every disease and sickness. These are the names of the 12 apostles. First, Simon, who is called Peter and his brother Andrew, James, son of Zebedee and his brother John, Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas and Matthew, the tax collector, James, son of Alphaeus and Thaddeus, Simon the zealot and Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him. Now, Pastor Scott spoke last week powerfully from uh, Matthew chapter 9 at the end. And of course, the Bible was never written as chapter and verse uh, originally, but it's been split up the way it has to make it easier for us to navigate around it. Although I wish they'd done it in alphabetical order. It'd be so much easier, wouldn't it, if the A's were at the beginning and the others were at the end than having to think uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke and John well, yeah, uh, and that sort of thing. But as I looked at the old King James version of the Bible, um, it begins chapter 10 with the word and, which to me indicates a definite continuation from one chapter to the other, as it would have been before the split up into chapters and verses for our convenience. And speaking about the harvest and the need for workers to go into the harvest field is how chapter 9 ends. But it continues in chapter 10 with Jesus sending out his disciples and he gives them a task and the authority to fulfill that task. And in one sense, it's a strange reading because whilst verse 1 tells us about this, verses 2 to 4 just tell us the names of people, the disciples. So thank you, whoever chose this Bible passage for me, for just giving me lots of names, apart from one little bit. Um, smiley face, I don't mind at all. But it does give historical context, and for me, it gives blessing. Because some of those folks I know of, but there are those I can't say I know much about. Do you? It comes as a blessing, and I'll tell you why later. It was to this group that Jesus gave authority to drive out impure spirits, to heal every disease and sickness. And given that chapter 10 is a continuation of chapter 9, to make disciples go into the harvest field, reap the harvest of people by preaching the gospel. Indeed, chapter 10 follows through with that too. It comes up again later. In fact, there are other Bible readings that take the theme, and Matthew 9 and 10 is often read along with Luke chapter 10, which begins with, after this, the Lord appointed 72 others and sent them two by two ahead of him to every town and place where he was about to go. He told them the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into the harvest field. And of course, there's the famous passage that everyone's probably familiar with at the close of Matthew's gospel, the Great Commission. Then the 11 disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Then Jesus came to them and said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. And surely I'm with you always to the very end of the age. Jesus gathers his disciples closely about him. He reviews for them their base of authority and he gives them their marching orders into the world. And at no other place in the history of the world is it more obvious that the Lord has committed the gospel of, to his church. And Matthew declares that the content of the gospel is good news. And he instructs his disciples to cross the barriers of geography, socioeconomic disparities, cultural and racial, different, racial differences, interpersonal relationships. Go out there with the good news of God in Christ Jesus. 
Amen. And it's still vital today, as it was all those years ago, to be reminded of the great three great missionary motives, the command of Christ to go, the inner compulsion of the Spirit that says, I must go, and the voice from God that keeps saying, go. <laughs> and the needs of the world are obvious. The mission task of the people of God is not a matter of emotion or feeling. It's not a work to be carried on at our convenience. We're under orders of the Lord. So today we look at the authority given, and I hope you don't mind, but I'm going to use Matthew 28 as my springboard, and I also intend to include some personal testimony round about three o'clock this afternoon. <laughs> are you sitting comfortably? <laughs> there are at least three characteristics of this command from Jesus. There's the authority of the command. A religion or faith that's got no authority is worthless. Some have emphasized the autonomy of the individual to ridiculous extremes. And in the background of this principle, we could conclude that things pertaining to the Christian life are arbitrary or optional. We can do them or, or not do them as our heart or soul commands. But the flip side of it is the authority of Jesus Christ and he leaves no question. All authority, all power, the King James puts it, in heaven and on earth has been given to me, he says. They're the orders of the king. And if the church asks you to do it, you might waver. If the preacher asks you to go about it, you might think, well, it's all right for you. I'll think about it. If the only reason we had our missionary enterprise was that our churches were doing it, we might question it. But the Lord Jesus, whose authority is beyond question, has given the command and forever the principle is established. All authority belongs to him and he gives us authority to go out and make disciples, to go out and cast out evil spirits, to pray for the sick, to see them healed. It's the authority of the king, the task of the church, the task of the, the minister to show people who God is in Christ Jesus, the one who left the glory of heaven and came among people like you and me, who lived as a man, who gave his life sacrificially on Calvary's cross, who demonstrated the power of God over death and over the grave by his wonderful, glorious resurrection. We wouldn't be here if it wasn't for the resurrection. There'd be no point to be here because it'd be just a worthless gathering of religiosity. But because of the resurrection, there is life. Because he lives, I can face tomorrow. I didn't choose that one, but I'm so glad you did. Thank you. It's the one who so majestically and regally certifies his work. He's the one who royally stands by his disciples. He's with us in the thick of it. There with us. Uh, the cross was behind him. The resurrection was the sealing bond. He lived. He loved. He taught. He served. He died for the people of all time. And he has the right to say to his church, even to people like you and me, Go and make disciples. Indeed, the word translated authority means the power to issue orders or requisitions, the authority to take charge. Oh, I think I need a glass of water and something in it. <laughs> On the basis of his unique person and because of his sacrificial death and his victorious resurrection and his ascension to the right hand of God on high, the Lord Jesus asserts his authority and we should obey and go and make disciples. We should obey and go into the world. We should obey and pray for the sick. We should obey and cast out the demons. There's also a steady task. The Lord Jesus has not merely given us something to believe, but he's given us something to do. And here are the few sentences is the scope of our task. The command leaves no question. What's the business of the church? The business of the Christian is to bring people to God through Jesus Christ the Lord. It's to baptize those who are one. It's to teach the way and the work and the purpose of the Lord Jesus. It's written indelibly in the history of the church that the Christian thrives spiritually when passing on their faith or passing on the faith to others. God's been a missionary God from the very beginning. 
He called Abraham to go out to do on a missionary trip. He called the people of Israel out of Egypt so that they would be instrumental of his, of his redemptive purpose. And if you study the Psalms and the prophetic books of the Old Testament, you can see that God's always been seeking to communicate with his people the broadness and the depth and the range of his love for all people. The book of Jonah is a missionary book in which God seeks to reveal to the prophet and the people the extent of his concern to an unbelieving world. In fact, the book of Jonah is a stinging uh, rebuke to the narrow nationalism and the spiritual isolation of those who considered themselves to be the people of God during that day. And in many instances, the Lord Jesus showed his concern for those outside the nation of Israel. He gave the water of life to a despised Samaritan woman. In the parable of the Good Samaritan, he highly commended the Samaritan who took care of the man who was left for dead by the robbers. He called attention to the fact that uh, it was the Samaritan who expressed gratitude for his healing power. He heard the prayer of the Phoenician woman as she prayed for the deliverance of her daughter. And he was going to pour out his Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost so as to prepare the very disciples for a ministry to the whole world. God is a missionary God and he's concerned that his followers take his love and the message of salvation to the people of the world. And many followers of the Lord have professionalized the words of the Great Commission. They've applied it only to the clergy and to the missionaries. But that does violence to the scripture. It robs Christ's followers of their heritage and their opportunity as servants of the Lord. So some have internationalized the words of the Great Commission, applying it only to foreign mission. You know, will you go abroad? But when you, in, when you read it, it's, it's all inclusive. Each of us is to evangelize our own area of the world. In fact, the word go, go and make disciples, is actually, um, I've read, someone can explain it to you later, don't ask me. A participle with the force of an imperative. Go and do it. Get on with it, wherever you are. In our going about from place to place, we're to concern ourselves with mission, making disciples. So it's right, significant, it's appropriate for us to individually, personally review our concern for personal mission and the needs of the world. And the mission God gives us is expressed in personal terms. It's not meant to be done by professionals. It's meant to be an expression of the faith and the hope and the love of an individual found in personal relationship with Christ Jesus. It's the task of each Christian. Church may have some admirable characteristics. It could be financially successful, physically attractive, organizationally complete, but if it doesn't reflect a flame of missionary zeal, then surely the glory of the Lord has departed from it. And in the major cities and the towns of our nation, there are individuals who are groping, seeking, longing for the filling of a spiritual vacuum that they've got. Personal face-to-face -face encounters by the people of God can provide the good news of God through Jesus Christ. These areas are full of domestic problems, young people's dilemmas, economic anxieties, social and cultural chaos. There are great barriers that exist in the minds and behavioral patterns of tens of thousands of people. Jesus himself said, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. We all need to have an understanding that God is saying in Christ Jesus, as you go, you go with the one who is the way, the truth, and the life. Go in the power of the Lord. And as you go, make disciples and have no doubt about it. Regardless of what car they drive, regardless of the amazing house they might live in, regardless of the pounds they may or may not have in the bank, every single one is needy. Every single one has that vacuum that can only be filled by the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Which brings me to the divine presence. Because expressed, he expressed his authority for this mission. And he defined and continued and steady, the steady fast, a task of personal relationships with others. 
And he concluded his commission with a promise. And remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. And one of the traumatic experiences of personal relationship is the moment in which you must say goodbye to a close friend or relative. It's difficult to express feelings in a moment like that. Sometimes we say, I'll be thinking of you. By that we mean that in spirit we will be sharing our friends' experience, helping, sustaining, encouraging them in their new venture, though we might be separated physically. It does help to know that we're not forgotten and continuing relationships can be maintained by whatever means, texts, email, phone calls. But the Lord goes farther than that. He says, I will go with you. We do our best to keep in touch. But he goes with us. I've always been blown away by the fact that when I came here, God was with me. And when I got here, I discovered he was here already. And when I got chatting in the prayer time, because I was a bit, he was with those folks as well. It's amazing. He's with us all the time. John expresses the truth, the promise of a very real presence in chapters 14, 15 and 16 of his gospel. Always is the word that Jesus uses. It means all the days of summer, winter, autumn and spring, the sunny days, the cloudy days, the days of storm, the days of joy, the days of faith, the days of doubt, the days of victory, the days of defeat, the days of strength, the days of weakness, the days of peace, the days of war. The days of youth when significant decisions are made. The days of midlife when decisions are being carried through. The days of life. And yes, even the days of death and the years of eternity. I will be with you always. (laughs) And if we'll obey the words of Jesus' great commission, we would enjoy the fulfillment of that promise. The Lord blessing us with his presence those who give themselves to the task of witnessing, sharing, preaching the gospel, making disciples, being baptised. I wouldn't be here today if it wasn't for some believers coming over to this land to preach the gospel. For a church saying, let's bring the evangelists in. We want to have a real time of mission. Let's pray into that. I wouldn't be here today if it wasn't for a friend called Simon who was determined to somehow get me under the sound of the gospel and took me to a meeting where I bowed the knee before Jesus and said, Lord, will you be my saviour? Will you be my Lord? The gospel's so simple. We're all sinners, all of us. It's a barrier between us and God. The only way for the barrier to be removed in our lives is to acknowledge that Jesus Christ is God's son who came to destroy the barrier to make it possible for our inner spirit to be joined to God's Holy Spirit. He has the authority and the power to give new life. The prayer we need to pray is something like, Father God, I've sinned against you and I long to be forgiven. I believe that Jesus Christ died to take away my sin and I ask him to do that right now. I thank you that Jesus rose from the dead that I too may rise from the deadness of not knowing you to new life in Christ. I trust in you now with all my heart. Amen. Now, when the service is over, if you've really prayed that, or you want to pray that, tell Pastor Scott, come and tell me. We'll pray with you. We'll talk with you. But come and tell us. I became a Christian in 1978 in a Baptist church in Longfleet, pool down in Dorset just over the road for up the road from Pool General Hospital and up from the corner where the uh, Shah of Persia pub was I attended an evangelical free church in nearby Parkstone where the family of Simon the music student who I'd met while studying A-level music also worshipped I was so taken up by new life in Christ when I gave my life to the Lord Jesus it was so dynamic and real I felt like God had chopped my head open, put a funnel in and was pouring his love and his forgiveness into my very being. If anyone had said, are you born again? I knew at that moment I was because God was doing something that was beyond anything that could have been done by anybody else. 
I was so taken up by it all. It was so amazing. I started going along to the church regularly. We had morning and evening services. It was a church where there were more people in the evening than the morning and full of young people as well, maybe about 100 of us all at this church. And uh, I became friends with Simon's parents who became my spiritual parents, if you like. They mentored me. They helped me to study the Bible for myself. Ron Barnett was one of the church leaders and his wife, Muriel Barnett, the church missionary secretary. And they ran the youth group on Fridays. And attending the weekly Bible study and prayer meetings was, I thought, what all Christians did. So I just went along. Oh, there's a Bible study on a Wednesday. I'll go to that. <coughs> I didn't know there was only the few and far between who turned up at these things, but I went. Muriel Barnett invited me, introduced me to her missionary heart. And with her five children, along with anyone else who wanted to go, which included me, she would attend missionary meetings either at the church or in the area in Bournemouth or Poole. Actually, not just around the area, uh, we went to the annual convention at Weck International Headquarters that, when it was based in Bulstrode House near Gerard's Cross. And, and, and we, we came under the ministry of some great people of God. And I can remember hearing Dr. Helen Rosevere speak there. And uh, the guy who wrote the book, or is it Richard Bro not one who wrote the book about, uh, about mission and all the nations of the world and how to pray for them. There were regular missionary meetings at church, either at the weekend or instead the Bible study. And as a brand new Christian who could seriously identify with 2 Corinthians 5.17, therefore if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation, the old has gone, the new has come. Um, I, I had a heart for mission and to tell people about Jesus. I'd been churchified all my life and then suddenly freed from church to be born again and serve the Lord and tell others. I immediately had a heart for mission. And the first person I told how to become a Christian was my best friend David from school in Bournemouth. In fact, when I got home that night in 1978, I was on the phone telling my friends about my new faith. And that they too could be born again. And, and David invited me around the next day. And the little booklet we'd been given, uh, I gave it him and explained the way. I'm not saying I was fantastic, but it was so dynamic, so real, I couldn't keep it to myself. Something had truly happened to me. But it did come with a problem. Whenever a missionary or a pastor would say something like, perhaps God is calling you. I could feel my heart pounding. And I'd be thinking, and if I'd have responded every time, I'd have been a missionary all around the whole world. <laughs> what I recognize today is that God had his hand upon me and was beginning to make it clear that he wanted me to serve him and to tell others about Jesus. Well, because of illness, I had to retake my second year of A-level study. I'd begun collapsing with what was thought to be panic attacks. And then they thought, oh, it must be psychological, so we'll give him various things. So I was put on loads of tablets. I, um, I was given Valium, sleeping tablets, pink tablets, blue tablets, white tablets. I was just 19 years old. So it wasn't that I failed my A-levels and therefore needed to do retakes. It was because I wasn't well enough to attend the exams. And so I had to do the year again. I did get a little bit better. And a year later, I did pass and then began a degree in music at what was uh, then Colchester Institute of Higher Education. But the problems returned. They'd never really gone away. And a different GP, this time in, in uh, Colchester, was horrified about the tablets I was on. Not that he did much about it, apart from start to wean me off them, going on a course to get off, because you go through the EBGBs, the amount of tablets I was on, and I had to go on what was basically a drug rehabilitation course. And during that first year of my degree, I became quite ill again, and I was asked to consider taking a year off to get well. It's what I did. And during 1981, I was 21 years old, I ended up in Bournemouth Chest Hospital, where I was diagnosed with asthma. The consultant there said he looked through my medical records. He could trace it back to when I was about 13. No more Valium. No more sleeping tablets. Just the usual stuff for people with asthma. And during that year, whilst waiting to go back to music college, I continued to attend church and I was fully involved. My health was a million times better. And one Sunday evening in church, one of the chosen hymns, was by a guy called Frank 
Horton, the Reverend Frank Horton, who was born in Stafford, just down the road. He missioned with what was then the China Inland Mission, now known as OMF International. The hymn was Facing a Task Unfinished. I'm going to sing it. Facing a task unfinished that drives us to our knees, a need that undiminished rebukes our slothful ease. We who rejoice to know thee renew before thy throne. The solemn pledge we owe thee to go and make thee known. Where are the lords beside thee hold their unhindered sway? Where forces that defy thee defy thee still today? With none to heed their crying for life and love and light. Unnumbered souls are dying and pass into the night. We bear the torch that flaming fell from the hands of those who gave their lives, proclaiming that Jesus died and rose. As is the same commission, the same glad message as Fired by the same ambition, to thee we yield our paths. O Father, who sustain them, O Spirit, who inspired, Saviour, whose love constrain them to toil with zeal untired. From cowardice defend us, from lethargy awake. Forth on thine errand send us to labour for thy sake. I couldn't sing the words. And as I stood with the congregation to sing the hymn, the words hit me hard. I could not honestly sing, We who rejoice to know thee, renew before thy throne the solemn pledge we owe thee to go and make thee known. God was stirring my spirit. He was challenging me. I knew that I needed to be one who made Jesus known while there was still time for people to find him. I began to feel uneasy about having to go back to music college in the September of 82. And I can only say that I had a longing in my heart for village evangelism. I'd been brought up in the village, I'd gone to church, and I think maybe that's the reason why I felt I want to be involved in telling people about Jesus. All these villages around the nation have got a church and half of them, they don't preach the gospel. Perhaps why, that's why I wanted it. But how could I, who'd been so unwell and had as a result affected others who in turn had become unwell and I'd had to retake study at college and, and uni and others had to do the same because they'd looked after me and fell behind. How could I be suitable to be an evangelist? In fact, some of the folks at church advised me to complete my degree in music and then consider doing something else. But the challenge to my spirit was immediate. No messing about. Get on with it. <coughs> that first Christmas, I met my friend Simon and nervously shared with him that I didn't think I'd be returning with him to Colchester to study. He quite shocked me by saying he knew. What do you mean you know? And he referred back to 78. He remembered me walking up the aisle in that church 
desperate to find peace with God. And something in his spirit said, David will be called of God to do something for the living God. I couldn't take that as my reason for doing what I was going to do, but it was a wonderful confirmation of what was already beginning to happen. Eventually, my daily reading of Scripture, the words of Acts 20, 24, leapt out at me and hit me in the face. I've been looking about Bible colleges. Oh, I didn't know if there was one in Malta, but Malta's in the Bible. Um, <laughs> Jerusalem is, but I didn't know if there was one there. But people have been telling me about London and Glasgow and Edinburgh, and they're not mentioned in the Bible, believe it or not. About the nearest we get is, and did those feet in ancient times. And I don't think that's a particularly biblical hymn. But there you go. So I started reading for the Bible for what it was worth. Gave up searching for a verse for me. And I was reading through Acts and pow, like that. However, I consider my life worth nothing to me. If only I may finish the race and complete the task the Lord Jesus has given. The task of testifying to the gospel of God's grace. I knew God was speaking to me. He'd given me his word. I spoke with a pastor. He listened to me and he said, David, I'm only going to support you if you do what God is telling you to do. Within a year, I heard of the Faith Mission, a UK-based missionary organisation set up to do rural evangelism in the hamlets and villages of Great Britain. They got a college in Edinburgh. It was more a missionary college than anything. And before you knew it, I was there. The church in Colchester, where I'd studied music for that one year, arranged a sending out service, a valedictory service for me. So I travelled from Edinburgh, from, uh, to Edinburgh from Bournemouth via Colchester. And then on the train to Edinburgh, the doubts set in. How could God ever use me? I'm so unworthy. Who do I think I'm kidding that I'll be ever able to stand up and speak out about Jesus? I determined to get off the train at the next stop and return home. But God had put me on an express train <laughs> with hardly any stops. So I got out the book that someone gave me, Channel of Revival, by Reverend Duncan Campbell. The faith Mission's mentioned in it. He was one time the principal there. And uh, under the power of the Holy Spirit, Duncan Campbell was used by God in a powerful way when revival hit the Hebrides, Lewis, and affected Harris. And I read avidly, and I saw what God did in a mighty outpouring of his spirit. Some of the pubs closed down because lack of interest. Nobody wanted to go. They wanted to go to church to hear the gospel where they were feeling terrible about their sin and only ever relieved when they put their faith in Christ. And I remember bowing my head and I said, Lord, if you can use me just a fraction of the amount that you did with Duncan Campbell, I'll stay on this train. You know the preachers in this church. There's David, there's Scott, there's Paul, there's Steve, there's Rainey, Malcolm, there's me. You might think, I can never be like them. You possibly see us as the disciples whose names you recognised earlier. But think of yourself as one of the others who think, who's that? How did he get in there? And what's Judas doing in that as well? You might not even think your name is on any list of disciples God could ever use. But you'd be wrong. He takes the weak things of the world to shame the strong. He uses ordinary people like you and me. Those he calls, he also equips. He's not only given authority to preach the gospel to those named in Matthew 10 or the 72 mentioned in Luke 10, but his authority is to share, to preach, to care, to cast out demons, to pray for the sick. That calls to all of us. So here then in this uh, final word of our Lord to his people is you take it from here. I'm giving you a task. Will you do it? Tis day, today's disciples need to recognise and respond to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. He's not only our saviour, he's also our power. To him has been given the right to lay claims on all. 
all that we are, all that we have. He should be the great authoritative figure in our lives. And as we emphasize his authority, we need to remember his love and his devotion, which he demonstrated by dying on the cross for us sinners. And at the highest moment in the ministry of Christ, he expresses the royal authority of a king. It is by the authority of heaven and the authority of the earth entrusted to him that he says to every Christian, you take it from here. Get on with the task. So let each one of us individualize this great commission from Jesus. Let's not miss the opportunity to be a co-worker with him. We might be mocked, but the authority to preach, to share, to care, to proclaim the gospel is given to us. And there will be those who are desperate to hear it. And so glad we took the courage to open our mouths and share it. Let's pray. Lord, we think together of the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Given the power to the apostles to witness to the resurrection of Jesus. And your word says that great grace was upon them all. Your word says, for I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to the salvation for everyone who believes. My speech and my preaching were not with persuasive words of human wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power. For our gospel did not come to you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and in much assurance. Therefore, most gladly, I will rather boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon us. Lord, we know our weakness and we look to you for your strength, for the courage of God to share the gospel, for the courage of God to pray for the sick, for the courage and protection of God to cast out demons. We believe that the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow. And we believe it's a discern of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Your word tells us to be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might because you've not given us a spirit of fear but of power and of love and of sound mind according to the power that works in us. Lord, whatever we seek to do within the body here, may we know the authority of Christ to do it and the power of the Spirit to do it. May it be that when we go from here, our witness is on fire for you, whether it's a quiet word, whether it's a mighty proclamation of your word, Will you equip us all? And Lord, if there are those here who sense a call of God even to go out and evangelize or to go around the world, will you not give up on them but keep speaking that word to them till they get involved in that work you've called them to? So Lord, take us, use us, bless us and may we be an amazing blessing to you in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, David. Brilliant. Let's stand and close our service in response to, to, the, to the message. If there's anybody who's, who, if God's spoken to you, if the Holy Spirit is tickling your heart, please, please don't ignore it. Let's, uh, let's sing. spirit and truth pouring out the oil of love as my worship to you in surrender i must give my every part lord receive the sacrifice 
of a broken heart. Jesus, what can I give? What can I bring to so faithful a friend, to so loving a king? Savior, what can be said? What can be sung as a praise of your name for the things you have done? Oh, my words could not tell, not even in part of the death of love that is owed by this thankful heart. deserve my every breath for you've paid the great cost giving up your life to death even death on a cross you took all my shame away that defeated my sin opened up the gates of heaven and I beckoned me in Jesus what can I give what can I bring to so faithful a friend, to so loving a king? Savior, what can be said, what can be sung as a praise of your name for the things you have done? Oh, my words could not tell, not even in part. Of the debt of love that is owed by this thankful heart. Jesus, what can I give? What can I bring to so faithful a friend, to so loving a king? Savior, what can be said, what can be sung as a praise of your name for the things you have done? Oh, my words could not tell, not even in part of the death of love that is owed by this thankful heart. Folks, as we finish the service, you know we don't finish the service. We begin the service of going into the world. Um, but oh, please man. take some time to have some coffee, tea, catch up with friends, make a new friend. Um, if you'd like to give towards the work of the church, we have our, our giving station there. And those who'd like prayer after the service, our prayer team are right here. I just have a sense, as I listen today, that there's an urgency to God right now. Amen. And we can think about the Middle East, and we can think about Ukraine, and we can think about Afghanistan and Africa, etc. But in a way, that's deflecting, because there's an urgency that God has right now for Frodsham and Hillsby. And He's calling. And He's calling you to answer the question, what can I do? What can I bring? So we always close, as always, with the benediction. So if you want to grab the hand of the person next to you, you can grab my arm. <laughs> and now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all, now and forevermore. Amen. God bless.